also brought with him a guest who's on the client and will be sharing some of her wisdom and experience with us. Um, but I'll, I'll let you do. Thanks. Uh, it's an honor, and I'm sorry that Judy's ill, and we wish her a speedy recovery. Judy, I hope you're watching this. Anyway, um, hi everybody. So, I have a PowerPoint, but I really like to talk more than I like to do PowerPoint. And if you wish uh, the slides or the PowerPoint, don't feel like you have to like write a lot. But what's more important to me is that I'm encouraging your thinking, and my goal uh, is to persuade you uh, and educate you to want to learn more about this whole area of expertise. Um, very briefly, I got interested in this subject because when I was 19, I was recruited into a, uh, a destructive mind control cult called the Moonies mm -hmm. that has hundreds of different names, which are on my freedomofmind.com website if you want to know hundreds of different names. but they, <laughs> One name you may be familiar with is the Washington Times, which you may not think of it as owned by the Moonies. The big newspaper or the University of Connecticut Bridgeport is owned by the Moonies, or most of Gloucester is owned by the Moonies, at least their waterfront. Um, and I dropped out of my junior year of Queens College. I was a writing major and spent two and a half years as a devoted follower, believing that Moon was my father and his wife was my mother and that my real parents were my physical parents only and that Armageddon was gonna happen in 1977 and that the world needed to change, that we would uh, take over the world and I was a great leader and it's a long story, but I'm trying to just let you know this comes from a personal wounded healer kind of place from 1976 when I fell asleep at the wheel of a van and drove into the back of a Mack truck at 80 miles an hour and almost died. Broke my leg and it was in that period in the hospital where I was away from the group and sleeping and eating that I reached out to my sister, Thea, who I was very close with. And she persuaded me to come visit. I hadn't seen her in over two years. And she had a child, my nephew, that I hadn't met. And I made her promise not to tell my parents because they were evil and satanic, because they said I was in a cult and I was brainwashed. Mm -hmm. Of course I wasn't brainwashed. I was just doing what God wanted. Mm -hmm. uh, they did, she did tell my parents, they did do an intervention. And five days later, I was like, how could I believe all of this stuff? Uh, it wasn't quite um, that reflective. I more or less broke down and cried for three hours to start the waking up process. The book that helped me the most, and I'll just do a flash for the video, was this book that came out in 1961 by Robert J. Lifton. He was an Air Force psychiatrist in the 50s studying brainwashing in communist China. And he was asked by the military to define what brainwashing was. And in chapter 22, he outlined eight criteria. Uh, uh, and at, in my intervention called the deprogramming, they went over the eight. And it was clear that we, meaning the family, meaning the unification organization, did all of those. And I was very confused because they were Satan. Communist China was Satan. And we were God but we were all, do, all doing the same brainwashing. Mm -hmm. Of course, in the Moonies, we were told it was heavenly brainwashing because we believed in God, and they were satanic, and they didn't believe in God. In any case, it began a lifetime uh, interest to not only understand what social influence is all about and mind control is all about, but help others who are imprisoned in a wide range of different totalistic mind control environments, everything from political cults to therapy cults to business cults to religious cults, the cults of personality, like a single individual narcissist, for example. Uh, some family systems have some of those same behavioral uh, components. Let me just uh, move along here. Um, and I am a licensed mental health counselor here in Massachusetts for 20 plus years, and I've flown around the world giving 
workshops and seminars to mental health professionals. Um, but to this day, most mental health professionals do not know what you're going to learn in the next two hours. Uh, and it really is a shame because I've been doing this work for 37 years and it should be in coursework of every single uh, uh, course, in my opinion, uh, for anyone going to therapy or anyone going to the clergy for that matter. Uh, and I also want to add, in the last six months, I've gotten very involved with human trafficking, applying with my models uh, to uh, people that I believe are in commercial cults, basically, uh, whether it's uh, sexual exploitation or labor or both. Uh, so I'm hoping that my work will get more uh, attention and more people will get help. Um, <coughs> So, the biggest thing I want to say to therapists uh, is keep in mind that the person sitting in front of you, whatever presenting problem, find out more about their background and history and not just their family of origin and what birth order and such. But ask them, don't say were you ever in a cult, but ask them, tell me about you, you know, some really important experiences you've had growing up. Or were you ever involved with a church or an organization that was, you know, had very strong, strict rules and regulations around information? Because as I will go into, information control is one of the major mind control techniques. Do you have the bike model handout? So very briefly, I took Lifton's uh, eight criteria, Margaret Singer, who was army psychologist, six conditions. Uh, and yes, and um, and then I took Leon Festinger, who wrote a book in the 50s called When Prophecies Fail. It was one of the first books about apocalyptic cults, and he came up with cognitive dissonance theory. Is that familiar to Thoughts, feelings, behaviors, you change one, the other two will shift to reduce dissonance. I basically took Festinger's model and added information control. <laughs> and later just called it the bite model so that you can remember it easily. Behavior control, information control, thought control, and emotional control. And my model basically talks about a, um, come back to this, a basically I want to introduce you to the idea that there's a continuum of influence from healthy and constructive to destructive to extremely destructive. And the notion that that's so important in the constructive pole uh, is honoring the person's individuality, their talents and abilities, that they should have free will, that they should have informed consent, that they should have access to medical treatment, that they should have access to information, free press, that they should have access to friends and other people that they want to associate with. Uh, as opposed to this other side of the continuum, the extreme destructive one that says, we know what's best for you. We will tell you what you can read and what you can't read and what person you can associate with and what person you can associate with. And tries to clone people in the image of the leadership so they think the right way and walk the right way and feel the right way. Um, and where there's a heavy emphasis on dependency and obedience. Heavy emphasis on fear and guilt manipulation. Um, and I'm not going to go through all my slides because I think it's way further down, but a key notion is uh, a dissociative dissociation notion that when I was recruited into the Moonies, the Steve Hassan, son of Milton and Estelle Hassan, who wanted to be a creative writing major and play basketball, was attacked, my sense of self was attacked and in a controlled in information experience where altered states of consciousness like hypnosis was used mm -hmm. and a new cult identity was formed primarily out of child parts mm -hmm. of, of the real me. Uh, and this new identity was superior, it was dependent on Moon and his wife and suppressed the real me. It didn't erase the real me, but the real me was 
silence and push down. And um, then over my 37 year career, I can tell you I've been working increasingly with people born in mind control cults who are now out, whether they were kicked out or whether or not they walked out or counseled out. Um, a lot of the people born in cults go, but what, I don't have a pre-cult self, you know, what's, what's up with that? And all I can tell you is it's my belief that people are kind of born with an authentic self, even if we're tiny little people, uh, that n knows what real love feels like and, and wants truth and wants meaningful work and so that even in the worst of the destructive mind control groups there's a kernel of a self that wants to be free and that's why they're seeing me because they're like okay I'm, I'm out but who am I? I I know that that's wrong I know I don't believe that anymore but I have no clue of who I am or what I'm supposed to be doing on the planet and so I've had to evolve a strategy that was very focused on the here and now saying look the way to recover from destructive mind control is to learn how to control your own mind. And that includes knowing wh who you are. It includes knowing how the mind works, how emotions are supposed to work if you had a healthy upbringing, how thoughts are supposed to work. You're not supposed to be controlled by thoughts. You're not supposed to be controlled by feelings. That the locus of control has to be in you versus looking to some external authority figure. And so when I'm working with someone, I don't want them to look at me as the guru or the prophet or the messiah. I want so my model is very much I'll coach, I'll share my journey with you, I will help empower you, but you've got to figure it out for yourself. The good news is you're not alone. The good news is there's a lot of hope. The good news is there's a lot of resources, especially in 2014, that didn't exist when I was getting out in 76. Um, and there's a community where people are no longer feeling totally isolated, like I'm crazy. I believed all this crazy stuff. Now people can network amongst each other. That's one of the reasons why I'm putting up so many videos on my website and others are putting uploading videos onto YouTube because when you're in one of these groups, you think, we are the elite. You know, all the other groups are bad. All the other human institutions are wrong. But we know the truth. And then when you start listening to other people saying, they know the truth, and they know the truth, then you start to see the pattern of, wait a minute, they're all pyramid-structured, authoritarian, totalistic, mind-control groups that don't value individuality and free will and emphasize this this dependency, pyramid structure, authoritarian, ends justify the means very much. Um, and so my work is to, to say, look, be in the here and now, be in your body. I'll, I'll help share what I've learned and what my other clients have taught me are tools that have been helpful for them. But you, you, need, to, you need to direct what's working for you and what's not working for you and such. And um, So I very much look to the person to inform my therapeutic strategy as opposed to trying to have a dogma or a therapeutic treatment model that I impose on people. Uh, and it's heavily psychoeducational, again, because I say the way to recover is to learn how the mind works, learn about social psychology, learn about hypnosis. Uh, Develop a model for what's healthy and what's not healthy. Develop a toolkit for assessing and reality testing. And people love it because I'm not being authoritarian. I'm not telling them to dictate reality. I'm, it's a revelation. It's a revelation for many of my clients for me to say, you know, emotions are our friends. They tell us stuff. You know, they're not negative emotions that you're. Because in a cult, you're typically ta taught any thought or feeling that goes against the guru or the doctrine or the organizational practice is evil. And so people are trained to do thought stopping and affect blocking, again, with this notion. 
And so when they're out, it's like, hmm, what does that part have to say to you right now? What is that feeling? And to get to create a notion that we want to have healthy balance. And again, the emphasis for me is on positive psychology in the sense of if you had a healthy upbringing, this is the kind of relationship you would people are supposed to have with their parents. And these are the kinds of experiences young kids are supposed to have. And for many of the people born in cults, it's, it's like you're telling someone who is uh, you know, in a gulag, you know, by the way, we have a Target that sells 4,000 types of food and 8,000 types of clothing and stuff. It's like, huh, what are you talking about? It's because they have, it's so out of their experience. Um, I want I want. I have so much I want to talk, but I'm looking at your faces, and I just want to check in. Like, what do you think? Do you have? Uh, does any of you have clients who report having a you know, mind control destructive experience? Anyone grow up in one of these environments or families? Nothing coming to mind. Anyone have a client who's in the Jehovah's Witnesses? It's in my opinion, based on my therapy, it's a totalistic mind control cult, yeah. and all levels, and in many ways worse than a lot. Because uh, are you aware that the largest um, uh, legal judgment was made uh, for sexual abuse, uh, sexual abuse uh, survivor uh, this past year, 19, in, in 2013? based on the fact that Jehovah's Witnesses' leadership have known for decades about pedophiles in their congregation and never reported them to the police and never took, took you know, taken them away from victimizing other people. And former leaders have come out with all the records and that's why the, the, I think this California uh, jury did $21 million punitive damages against the group. And it's the beginning of many, many more lawsuits. So I would be interested in hearing you talk more about that, where there's a an institution or a religious movement that is relatively socially sanctioned, which I think, yeah. you know, as, as an example, because I, I think of that as, I, that was exactly an institution that came to mind in listening yeah. to you talk, but I also think of it as an institution that it's been around we, since the 1800s right we would tend to perhaps expect ourselves to be open-minded exactly. yeah right and so that would be quite helpful yeah absolutely and um we have lara who will be speaking about another bible-esque type cult environment, uh, a particular group called the Boston Church of Christ, which morphed into the International Churches of Christ, but it's a subgroup of a larger set of hundreds of other cults called Shepherding Discipleship Cults. And the notion in this Shepherding Discipleship is that in order for you to have a relationship with Jesus, you need to submit and obey your shepherd or your discipler or your discipling partner who submits and obeys to their discipling partner mm -hmm. up the chain to whoever is the prophet or at the top of the pyramid of the particular church or denomination. But behavior control, information control, thought control, and emotional control par excellence. Um, I also want to put in a plug, I'm on the board of advisors for a fledgling nonprofit called the Child Friendly Faith Project. And it was founded by Janet Heimlich, whose father is the Heimlich Maneuver. Heimlich. <laughs> she wrote a book called Breaking Their Will, uh, Preventing Religious Maltreatment in Children. Mm -hmm. uh, is specifically interested in making sure children get medical care, protected from pedophilia, uh, and other uh, uh, not corporal punishment with a stick, you know, till they bleed. Uh, not punished for having imagination, as the 12 tribes in the Sinai communities does. Um, so take the word cult and put it aside. Just think totalistic, black and white, us versus them. We have the truth. Uh, submit and obey uh, notion, whether 
again, and then let's go past the vulnerabilities. So here's here's a set of slides. Um, again, one of the books I read in 1976, another uh, army psychologist studying brainwashing, he talked about you unfreeze the person's sense of self, you disorient them, sleep deprivation, you can go through a number of the bite model, you change, which is indoctrinating the new identity, and then you refreeze. So there's many different techniques, disorientation. By the way, if you want to if you want to mind control someone, the fastest way is confuse them. Confuse them and put them in an environment with other people who are all acting like they they know what's really going on. And um, I'm not going to get to the slide now, but do you remember Social Psych 101? Remember the Ash Conformity Study and the Milgram Obedience Study and the Zimbardo Prison Study? And if you don't, you should look it up on YouTube. Uh, Solomon Ash, A-S-C-H. But people are looking at lines, sample lines, and everyone's a confederate except the person in seat six, and they're all congruently saying the wrong line is the correct line, and two-thirds of people start giving the wrong answer. Mm -hmm. And it's not because they're stupid, it's not because they're uneducated, it's because we're human beings and we're wired to survive. We're wired to adapt. <laughs> it's deep in our brain <laughs> core of, you know, I doubt myself because everyone else seems so certain, as opposed to, this is weird, I think it's this, everyone else is that. I know that you know the laws of mathematics, like a, a two inch line should equal a two inch line, I should get up and measure it, <laughs> even with a finger, to see which line is the same. But everyone's too polite to get out of their seat, or to use abstract rules to reality test, because it's not part of our normal script for how to behave. And, and so I, uh, that's part of my, yes, do you want to ask a question? Yeah. I'll make um, a comment. So, yeah, so I think it's both. Um, that example makes me think also of the consequences of not conforming. Yeah. We know that even with organizational behavior, right? If you, if you don't follow the norms, you get kicked out. Some way in which you get rejected Shunned. from the community, right? Yep. Um, but I was wondering from your own experience and the experience of others that you I've worked with, like, what are the potential risks and costs, not just psychologically, but potentially like, real threats to someone's life should they choose to leave within an, from an organization that is powerful and has tentacles everywhere? And so most of my population that I've worked with, it really was about installing phobias or utilizing existing phobias as that control. So in my case, and I didn't realize it for years until after I was out of the group and studying psychology, but I was literally taken with several hundred Moonies in 1974 into a, a cinema in, in New York City and shown the Exorcist movie. Mm -hmm. Bust up to hear Sun Myung Moon give a lecture about how God made the Exorcist. I should do it better. God made the exorcist. This movie is a prophecy of what will happen to people who leave the unification church. You know, and it didn't even connect back into my consciousness. Oh, that's where I started having fear. <laughs> like really extreme fear. That girl with her head going around, the yeah. green goo, and um, so there's and I, I have in my la latest book, the Freedom of Mind book, that's, and you may want to uh, send it around, it's this one. I have a whole chapter on phobias. I have four pages of the most common phobias that I've come across in my work, whether it's you're going to get cancer and die, or you're going to be hit by a car, or your mother's going to die of a heart attack, you're going to have stillborn children, <laughs> you're going to be possessed by evil spirits. So it, you can go through the laundry list, but then I have a three-step intervention how to uh, help people understand that they have a phobia and that it's not really a danger. Like you can believe you're gonna go insane if you're in Scientology, if you ever talk to a psychologist, that they're gonna do a lobotomy on you, give you <laughs> medication, and they're gonna rape you. That's what Scientologists like Tom Cruise have been taught. 
they can't imagine sitting with a psychologist having a positive experience. Not possible. But they, once they can, then it opens up the door for uh, them getting help other than going to Scientology for more Scientology tech treatment. Um, I went on a tangent and I lost my train of thought. Um, so what was I so talking about phobias and fears? Yes, so how human trafficking, which is a relatively new population for me, some of the women I've talked about, talked about how the pimp said, I will hunt down your parents and you know, shoot them. I will you know, cut them up slowly and it will be on you. If you want to run away or you want to tell the cops, I will kill them. Or, you know, she's watched, you know, uh, him beat someone else up, or brand someone, or slice someone up. Um, so that's not a phobia. That's really coercion and, and assault and battery. Um, so it's a whole other dimension. That's why I have two models of the bite model. I made a new one for human trafficking, adding those extreme things, using drugs, people <coughs> hooked on drugs, kidnapping them gang raping them. That's typically not done in the Moonies or in the Jehovah's Witnesses or uh, any number of other mind control groups. So this notion of the dual identity, um, <clears throat> so I want to emphasize, you can't go to, you, you, you can't say to the person, were you in a cult or were you, are you under mind control? I was, I was on Oprah Winfrey in 1989. Uh, she was doing a show on the, a cult called The Church Universal and Triumphant. And there was a, a businesswoman who had been a member of the cult for like 10 years in the audience. And she said, are you under mind control? She said, no, not at all, Oprah, I'm a businesswoman. I'm mm -hmm. really good. And Oprah put her hands on her hips. See, like, that was proof. We asked her, and she said she wasn't. And I was like, Oprah, if you asked me when I was in the Moonies, I would have said exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. But I never got a chance to say something like, well, how about this? So you're in the Church Universal how long? Oh, 15 years. Have you ever had a friend in the church? Oh, yeah, I have many friends. You ever have a friend who left? Uh, yeah. Oh, so when they left, did you sit down and talk with them and ask them why they left? And then you see the blank. You see the curtain come down because they're not allowed. To, you're not allowed to say anything negative. And she was, and she was in a situation where she kind of knew that if she said no, I didn't. And she, that's what she said. That's not normal. You have a close friend that you've known for years, and she left, and you've never sat down and asked why. Like, what's up with that? Or what's your real opinion about another church? Now, if you ask a cult member, can you leave any time you want, they'll say sure, because that's part of the indoctrination. Literally, the leader would say, you know, you can leave any time you want, go ahead. But <laughs> then you get the inner doctrine. Mm -hmm. So here's very quickly the lift and eight uh, things. I don't have the time to go through it, but it's in Freedom of Mind book. It's on my website. It's on the internet as well. Sing, Singer's six criteria. Uh, I'm not going to go through the bite model because you have that in front of you, except to talk about things like thought stopping. Right? We use it for behavior control that teach people to stop the negative thought and replace it with a positive thought. The difference is, is you're teaching patients and clients these skills for them to control their own mind and it's because they want to feel better because um, and so it's it, it is not a hidden agenda it's not an ideological uh, causality behind it in, in my group just to highlight it my father w once read a newspaper article saying moon had an m16 gun factory in South Korea and he thought aha being Jewish, you know, messiahs and gun factories don't exactly mesh. He called me up on the phone and said, hey Steve, uh, Moon has an M16 gun factory. How could he have, how could a messiah have an M16 gun factory? I started chanting, you know, glory to heaven, peace on earth, crush Satan, crush Satan. 
true parents, true parents, true parents, true parents. I was doing thought stopping. My cult self was doing thought stopping because he was trying to attack Father mm -hmm. and the divine principle and the most important church on the planet to save the planet. So my father's intention of saying something to make me s stimulate critical thinking backfired in a very big way. Mm -hmm. And that's part of my work with families and friends and what I've developed as a strategic interactive approach is basically creating a network of informed agents, family members, friends, ex-members, clergy, mental health professionals, in order to coordinate ethical influence on this person to do incremental positive change. Because after all, if the group is legitimate, it should stand up to scrutiny. And if it stands up to scrutiny, then I want to join it. If you truly are part of the best group on the planet, the only organization that can save the world's problems, then I want to join it. So let's talk, right? Now there are a few cults that are secretive and they deliberately make it hard for people to join. So that particular, and there's one locally called the Work, a Gurdjieff or, or, uh, oriented secret type cult. They typically frequent bookstores where the Gurdjieff books are and then they approach people and tell them after they read it they can call this number and then maybe we'll give you, call you for an interview, see if you're ready. So it's a very much, you have gotta be really special and ready. Did you want to ask something? Yeah, I was wondering if there's like a continuum of, I mean, I know you showed that line of, you know, like positive and negative. Um, it's meant to be, it says continuum because it's meant to be like the wide variations. And so in terms of groups that could exercise mind control, is there, you know, I think this question of, you know, the Jehovah's Witness and all that kind of like brings up these questions of like, well, what about other religious groups or like fundamentalists? Of That's why the Biden system. model is non-ideological. It's like look at these criteria mm -hmm. and honestly go to any group, any relationship, any family system and see whether it fits or doesn't fit. Or if it fits a lot, then it's probably on the more extreme destructive mm -hmm. end of the continuum. And if some of it fits, it's probably more in the middle. I guess so. That's a if bit of a question. If none of it fits, it's more healthy. So can you have a group that is like not all the way to one side, but like it's in the middle or like a little left totally. or something and it would still be considered like- Most right. are in the middle, it's a bell curve. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Most are in the middle. Quick anecdote, I got a call from a writer, uh, said my editor said I have to interview you for my book. I said, what's your book about computers? I said, computers, what's the name of your book? He said, The Cult of Mac. I <laughs> laughed. I said, I'll give you the interview, but I have to disclose I've only used Apple since 1982 and I have five Macs right now. And they all laughed and I'm in a book called The Cult of Mac. And there's cultish elements to it, but I'm not being coerced, I'm not being threatened, I'm not being guilt tripped, um, but it costs more. And, you know, but I'm very, as, as I'm learning more and more about Stephen Jobs, I'm getting more and more turned off to buying any <laughs> Apple products. But it's, it, you know, I'm, I'm not sitting here telling you I know the truth and I, I'm the ultimate decider of what's healthy or not. Mm -hmm. But if you use the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights as a baseline, you're not going to go too bad in terms of assessing. Because if a group is keeping people from medical treatment or telling people they can't read books because it's bad for them, instead of saying, read whatever you want to read, we don't agree with this book, or we don't agree with this author for this and this reason, but you make up your own mind, then they're doing information control. Or if it's a country, you know, abolishing the free press and taking the dissidents and exiling them or putting them in jail, it's a dictatorship. Yes? Um, do you think it's important whether the controlling person or people is being intentional about the environment that they're creating? So it's a really good question about intentionality. Um, in, my, in my career, I'd say most mind controllers were victims of mind control themselves and were kind of re, re 
what's the right word? Recapitulating their experiences, maybe with good intentions, but nevertheless negative behavioral uh, uh, consequences. Very few con artists who actually know that it's a con, or they know that they're not the Messiah, they don't like to stay around for very long. They want to get in, make the money, have the sex, and move on to the next mark. Mm. Cult leaders, well, I, you know, David Koresh, I am Jesus. Uh, they go up in flames, mm. ultimately. And most cult leaders do have display narcissistic personality problems, certainly attach serious attachment disorders. Um, I was viewed by many families as evil when I was a recruiter in the Moonies because I interrupted their children's education by recruiting them into the Moonies or getting them to break up in their relationships and such. But I was a true believer and I was doing it because I thought it was actually going to help people. And at the point that I got out, I felt very guilty. And I tried to make recompense and try to go and get them out and try to tell their families. Um, so intentionality is less important. I mean, as therapists, we just want to take care of our people, right? We want to empower them to have healthy lives and to have choices. Um, but um, yeah, I'm hoping that not only Job is witnesses, but I, I work with people who ran away from the fundamentalist Latter-day Saints. You know, Warren Jeffs, who's in jail, because he was marrying off 10-year-old girls to 60-year-old men. And I did some high-profile shows about that, and then I got invited to Salt Lake City by the Ex-Mormon Foundation. And they said, we want you to come and teach us about mind control. And you can see the video on YouTube where I'm teaching the bite model that you have in front of you, and 250 former Mormons were bobbing their head. Mm. And I was like, whoa, what's going on? This, you know, this is a mainstream religion, this, you know, but I really didn't know much about Mormons at that point, and I started learning more and more. It's kind of the adage, if it walks like a duck and has feathers like a duck and it quacks like a duck, could be something else, but the likelihood is the more behaviors you're seeing, the more concerning it might be. Can you talk about it? Is it I did not offend her. What? I hope I didn't offend her. Oh, people come and go. <laughs> Good. I, I wouldn't take it personally. Um, I'm not taking it personally. <laughs> Trust me. Uh, um, the Church of Latter-day Saints is Mormon? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Is the Mormon Church. Um, can you talk, like I feel a little, like I don't feel like I quite know what's like very much about Mormonism and I don't know how to think about whether or not it fits this at all. Yeah, so I, was I like, if you could talk a little bit about it. I, I know, actually don't, don't want to spend them. my last 15 minutes before we get ready for the oh. next thing about, specifically about the Mormons, but I can tell you that former Mormon leaders are the best people to tell you about control and manipulation Etc. within the Mormons. You could also um, be leaving the saints. Leaving the saints under the banner under of the heaven by Krakauer is a very popular <laughs> book. There, there was a fellow who, who blew my mind at, at that conference. He, his name is Ken Clark. His talk is on YouTube. And it's, the title of his talk was Lying for the Lord, Deception as a Man Management Tool of the LDS Church. And he started with Joseph Smith, and he culminated, because he was a, a professor and a teacher at their, in, their training institute. And he finished the talk with a recording of him with his boss saying, so you're telling me that I have to lie to my students in order to have, keep my job here? And his boss said, yes, that's exactly correct. Otherwise, you'll be fired. And he said, well, then I resign. That's on the internet. Um, I think people have the right to believe whatever weird things they want to believe, I really truly do. I'm, I'm a Jew, I believe some weird stuff in Judaism, and I meditate, and I do yoga, and, but I'm free to choose and unchoose. I'm free to, to, to decide you know, what books I want to read and what people I want to interview and such. The key thing is the issue of informed consent if a group is recruiting. They need to tell people up front what they believe, what they want from them if they join. 
And destructive mind control groups deliberately do not want to tell people up front who they are and what they believe. They want to do incremental indoctrination. And in my former cult, the rationalization that I was taught to use was that, well, you wouldn't feed a baby steak. It would choke. You have to feed it formula. Mm. Well, people are spiritual babies. You have to feed them what they can swallow. And that was, so they didn't say, yes, you have to lie. It was, no, you want to be a good person. You want to be a good parent. You want to feed people appropriately. Mm. But as opposed to a notion of, you know what, people are, are, are worthwhile and they're smart. And, you know, they need to decide their own path. I, I can persuasively tell, you know, my point of view, but uh, in the end, the people have to own what they want to believe and, and their choices. So I want to get back to a little bit more. Lara's going to tell some of her experience uh, being involved as a leader in a Bible cult for, is it 11 years? Almost 13. 13 years. She exited, and the mental health system failed her in a very big way. And, I, and we thought it would be fascinating for you to understand a lot of the errors that were going on. We can have dialogue about that. Well, let me just see if there are any other key points. So there's a whole thing on, on phobia. You guys don't. So extreme identity confusion, dissociation, panic anxiety attacks, a lot of psychosomatic symptoms. Um, What's, do you have an explanation for why they're, like, or is that, I don't really, so what's up with the psychosomatic symptoms? I really believe that authentic self, whether or not it's tiny ah, or it's like me was 19, is like, get out of there, <laughs> you know, exit, exit, warning, uh, warning. Yeah. And if you're in a, a group where you're sleeping three to four hours a night like I was, uh, you know, the body rebels too and says, no, 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 I'm going to make give you a backache or I'm going to make you break out so you can't work. So you have to rest or something. So um, decision making is a huge issue because these groups sabotage. You literally have a cult self that's saying, we know the truth, you have to go back, you know, otherwise you'll be possessed. Um, and um, in, a, in a destructive mind control environment or relationship, whenever, whenever there's something good that happens to the subject, then the leader takes credit for it, or the group takes credit for it. Any problem, it's the person. You're just not committed enough. You're just not praying hard enough. You're just not pure enough. <laughs> you just got to come. You got to. You'd be baptized again. You need, need to do this or that. So there's this constant dysfunctional blame loop that happens. Um, and people have nightmares. Some, they, they leave a group and they have problems for years and years, sometimes decades. And then they seek out mental health help. And because people are not oriented to understand this model, and explore it and learn, they try to fit the person into their therapeutic model. Mm -hmm. And they often do a lot of damage, as Laura will explain. Um, a lot of people, at least in the religious cults, talk about feeling raped in their soul. Like physical rape is minimal compared to spiritual rape. And then with people like myself, where I was then the rapist, recruiting other people into it and indoctrinating them, I felt really bad when I got out. Um, and at one point, I was 21 years old, and I was being encouraged to think about what country I wanted to run when we took over the world. Mm -hmm. And a year later, I'm out of a group almost having died with a cast on my leg from my toes to my thigh. And I was ashamed and embarrassed that I had ever fallen for this. And the typical person is the fundamental attribution error. Remember from social psych? Mm -hmm. What's wrong with you, Steve, that you fell for it? You're weak. You needed someone to tell you what to think. You needed someone to, to you, 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 um, 
just weren't educated religiously enough, or you weren't uh, confident enough. It's like, oh, I was an extra honor student. I bicycled cross country when I was 16. I was raised in my father's hardware business. And my father taught me how to know if someone was lying. You can tell by their eyes, he said. Mm -hmm. Except that he'd never come across a cult member before who would look you right in the eye and lie. Because they believe the lie. Because they were under mind control. A lot of situational vulnerabilities to these groups. Death of a loved one, moving to a new uh, city, state, or country, illness, graduation, romantic relationship. A lot of elderly people, a lot of baby boomers are getting recruited. It's not just, you know, 17, 18, 20 year olds. And I have a, a subspecialty in hypnosis and um, people who are high hypnotizable are more susceptible. And it was interesting, I was out of the group for about three years. I watched the stage hypnotist do a demonstration and I was like, that's very familiar. Because I used to talk like that when I was a leader in the Moonies with a very spiritual kind of voice. <laughs> it's like, what's that about? Um, and it's not the command hypnosis, it's the painting pictures and inviting people to project their own imagination type, where it's a bi directional process of the agents of influence, the cult putting out certain things, but people projecting their own meaning and understanding into it. Um, it turns out that people on the autistic spectrum, uh, especially Asperger's, higher functioning people, make very good cult members, and it's very hard to help them understand that the group says that they love you, but it's all conditional love based on you doing what they tell you to, to do that it's not real friendship. Very hard to convey that message. Um, these days with the internet, you can take the, you can ask somebody to tell me what's the name of the church that you were in when you grew up and you can literally go and put quotes around the name of the church and do plus cult or brainwashing, criminal, scam, or whatever, don't just do the first 10 hits, but go 100 deep. And if it's been around for a long time, you'd be amazed, but there probably is, a, if it's destructive, there's probably someone who wrote a blog or wrote something on some discussion board saying, hey, you know, I was there and the guy, you know, I was behind the scenes and they were, you know, instructing us that we have a quota, how many people we have to recruit or whatever. Tell you a quick story. A relative got involved with a multi level marketing uh, group, which I consider to be cultish group uh, because of the bike model attributes. And I went on the internet and I tried to find just what I was explaining to you. I couldn't find a single negative thing for years. And But I talked to people who are experts in the field. They said, hey, if you ever hear of Shackley, you know, bring it to me. And this past year, somebody contacted me, and it turns out that they did search engine manipulation in a very big way, where they set up thousands, hundreds of websites where they used all the key search terms for negatives and answered their own questions that they're not a cult. And so it was all directed back to them as a, you know, a healthy group that isn't doing these things. And there are actual teams of people on the internet on, for cults on Wikipedia trying to, you know, s uh, snow puff it. Um, interestingly, Scientology has been banned because they tried it too many times on Wikipedia and uh, did so many dirty, dirty tricks. And there's the Ash Milgram of uh, Zimbardo. So when you're in a, when someone's in a destructive cult, if you go, aha, don't say, by the way, don't you realize some people consider your group a destructive cult? The, the best thing is to get them to talk, tell you their story, go back in time, and, 
and start using stories of other groups that you are aware of that are not their group but other groups. So that's the major pattern for how to get around the thought stopping. Because if you ask me when I was in the Moonies, it was Scientology a cult, I would agree. Or the Hare Krishnas, they were definitely a cult. But if you then go into the bike model about Scientology or the Hare Krishnas, you can kind of back in into, so tell me how it's different. And the bottom line is that people will tell you what they need to know in order to get better. So, um, my latest book, there's my own. So, th I, that's the, the beginning of the, of the talk. I want to tell you that um, a, a, a family of origin taking and trauma-based approach is not sufficient for this population. Could you be able to send out your slides? Is that yes. something you do? Yeah, okay. I'll give it to David. I would just ask you to keep it amongst yourselves and not send it around or put it on the internet, please. I can, I can post it on our shared drive. I can post it like PDF. Okay. Yeah, just let's keep it amongst our class. And if you want to share it with someone else, just email me and ask permission. I'll probably give it. Um, do we want to take a quick break before we go? Or you just go? You're okay. I'm okay to keep going. Is everybody okay? Any feedback so far to part one? Yes. About the phobias that we talked about, do you find that that's long-lasting? Can you capture yes. it? How is one like Phobias, I, I, I literally met a woman who had been in the movies for like three months, like mm -hmm. years after. And she talked about, with me, it was at a social gathering, and she talked about um, having this deep-seated fear about having children, even though her whole life she always wanted to have kids. And I, and I just said to her, don't you remember in the group they, they said that we, people would have kids with genetic deformities or stillborn if they left, if they ever left the Moonies? And she, she dropped her, her drink because she had not remembered it. And it was like, bing. That's where that fear came from. Oh. So a lot of what I am teaching, we can get into that, and then I want to want to ask our guest to share some firsthand experiences. But a lot of what I am asking people to do, again, coming back to what I said when I sat down, is be in the here and now, be in their body, mm. have the locus of control for their life in them, and 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 essentially. Exit counsel the younger them, mm. and and the best way to do it is to ask them to go back in time to the beginning if they were recruited, knowing what they know now about mind control and cults, mm -hmm. and go back and and so for me I was sitting at the cafeteria of Queens College. My girlfriend had just dumped me, and three attractive women asked to share my table. They were pretending that they were students, and I said sure. Well, if I do that exercise and I go back in time, knowing what I know now about the Moonies, I go back into Steve's body, I go, no, you're in the Moonies. You're liars. You're not students. You're trying to recruit me. Security. Get them off the campus. Because I would never knowingly want to harm myself or my family or other people. But by doing that mental exercise, I'm like undoing Steve's cult formation identity. Right? By going back to key moments where Moon is saying, God made the exorcist, I'm imagining me standing up going, are you out of your mind? It's a Hollywood movie. It's totally fiction. <laughs> You're trying to install phobias in everybody. This is nuts. You're crazy. Let's get out of here. And even though I know it's not historical fact, I know I didn't do that, it's so liberating for the part of me that was a Heil Hitler Remember, yes, Father, we have to take over the world, yes, Father. Um, incredibly liberating. Um, so, and, it, and it's very, one of the biggest issues, to, where is it, trust, trust, number 14. How do I trust myself, because I let this happen to me, or how do I trust anyone else? 
How can I trust going to any church? How can I trust any relationship? How can I trust any employer? And it's like, because you're going to have a toolkit for reality testing. Because there is a continuum, and there are healthy behaviors, and there are unhealthy behaviors. And you can use your words, and you can use your eyes, and you can test reality, and make decisions on what's good for you. And not just do what some authority figure in a very loud, powerful voice tells you you have to do, or you have no choice. Remember Milgram? You have no choice. You committed to the experiment. You must continue. But the guy's got pain. He's screaming and yelling. You must continue. You have no choice. And people keep flipping the switches. Right? I do have a choice. I don't want to be a Milgram, you know, uh, uh, subject. I don't want to say, Heil Hitler, thank you very much. I'm out of here. Oh, you can't leave. Oh, yes, I can. Watch me. And you get up and walk out the door. Right? That's what I want to see happening, educating, inoculating young people and old people alike. You know, look, we're citizens. We have to take power back for our lives. If we see an injustice, there is a cost. We may lose our job. We may be shunned. But hell, it's better than giving up your soul, giving up your, your, your integrity, is what my message is. Um, do I sound like I'm on a soapbox? <laughs> I feel very powerful here, very passionately about this. Um, so there are tools and strategies. This revisualization strategy is a huge one. I love encouraging people to watch videos about other groups. And I love actually watching the video with my clients to get reactions and to use it as a teaching tool. I was just in Ohio doing a talk for uh, Human Trafficking Day there. And the therapists were like, oh, Medicaid would never reimburse for that. We can't show videos to our clients. I'm like, yeah, if it's the best way, the least threatening way to help them learn, and <coughs> that we're not allowed to do that. I'm like, I think the system needs to change. I think we need to think about what's going to be more effective for our, our, our population and not just what, what, what hoops uh, have been established by someone else. <coughs>